والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So uh, you know, coming to this convention now in 2022, I've been reflecting. I've had the last couple of years where we didn't have a convention, and I kind of got used to coming to conventions and speaking to people, and especially connecting with a lot of young people, and a lot of people that you know they may know me from. Um, the internet and online and whatever, when I come to ICNA convention, I get to actually meet my brothers and sisters, and it's awesome. And I've been doing this now, subhanAllah, and I, I feel old, but it's, it's coming up to a decade now that I've been doing this. And I've been reflecting a lot, and especially for this convention, you know, thinking about what we've been through, what's going on right now, and where we're headed. And thinking about the role of our faith and thinking about the next generation that is coming up and the challenges that they are facing. I think a lot of the brothers and sisters that are in my space of, of trying to inspire people and trying to connect people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're often dealing with challenges. What are the challenges that a lot of people are facing? What are the challenges that today, for example, young people are facing? And one of the things that I want to speak about today is a seeming disconnect between what our faith is or what we are told our faith is and then what is happening in our real lives. And subhanAllah, I remember being in Medina and studying in Medina and, and during Jum'ah we would go to the masjid and, and listen to the Imam give the khutbah and it was a very different experience than listening to the khutbah in, in America. You know, the Imam would come in very nice clothes, climb the member, be up high and deliver a very formal type of khutbah. And, and I've been to other countries as well, other Muslim countries where the Imam gets up and it's a very seemingly formal khutbah. You know, and I was used to coming from the MSA and stuff, a brother gets up, he pours his heart out and he's talking about real issues and all this kind of stuff. And then you go to some of these countries and it seems just very, and I was like, hold on, there seems to be a, a disconnect between what is being said on the member and what is happening in people's lives. Because oftentimes what we hear being preached about is the, is the ideal, what we're supposed to do, how we are supposed to be. As a Muslim, you're supposed to do this and this and this, and this is how you're supposed to be. And oftentimes we hear that and we come to conventions and we hear this and we hear this ideal. But in the back of our mind, there's this thought of, you know what, that's cool, and it felt good to hear that, but I got to go back to my real life after this. And my real life is complicated. It's messy. I'm dealing with real problems. This ideal Muslim is, is simply not me. It's cool to hear about it. It's fun to see religious people talk about religion, and, and, to, and yeah, it feels good. You know, it's just nice. But it doesn't really apply to me. Like in my real life, there's, there's just a tiny bit of space for Islam, but is Islam really my life the way I see it, see it being preached? And the reality of our faith, my brothers and sisters, the reality of Islam is that Islam was not sent to be practiced by perfect beings. Islam was sent to be practiced by imperfect being, by beings, by flawed beings, by people who make mistakes, by people who commit sins, by people who do wrong. But Islam was meant to be practiced by a people that are constantly striving to better themselves. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the goal. And I hope that those of my brothers and sisters who are in this space and who are trying to preach and inspire, that that is our, that's at least my goal. That I don't expect, and like when I give a talk, I don't expect that, you know, everyone's going to be a perfect Muslim now. But what I hope for, what I, what I make dua to Allah for is that I hope that we are at least inspired to better ourselves. That we come here this weekend and we say, you know what, here are some realistic changes I can make in my life because Islam is not meant for perfect people. You know, we hear stories of the Sahaba, we hear stories of the prophets and so on and so forth and we think, yeah, that's them, but this is me. But Islam was not meant for just one people. It was not meant for one time, it was not meant for one place, it was not meant for one culture. We can look at the world today and think the world is crazy. There's so many challenges, so many trials, so many fitin, and sometimes, and I hear sometimes religious people talk like that. 
right? That this, the world is too crazy right now. Like, we cannot survive. There's no way. And absolutely that is not the case and that is not the correct approach. Because if we believe that this deen is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah has sent this deen, then we have to believe that this deen, this way of life, this religion, this faith, is just as applicable today as it was 1400 years ago. أَلَا يَعْلَمْ مَنْ خَلَقْ وَهُوَ اللَّطِيفُ الْخَبِيرُ Does Allah not know what Allah creates when Allah is subtle, Allah is gentle, Allah knows every subtle difference between human beings. Allah knows every subtlety of our creation. And Allah is all aware. Allah knows. Allah knew when the Quran was sent, when the Prophet ﷺ was delivered, when he was delivering the message, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that the world would be like this in 2022. And just as Islam was sent for Arabia at that time, it was equally sent for us today in this complicated and this messy world that we live in. And so the question now comes, what do we do? How do we make sure that we find that value in our faith? How do we make sure that we, it's, it's easy to say, you know, our, 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 our Islam is just as applicable today as it was in history. But where does that come from? Where does that strength come from? And a lot of times, you know, it's, it's ironic that I'm standing here talking to young people. A lot of times, this is a conversation that I have with parents. Because parents come to me with a lot of anxiety about their kids and where their kids are growing up. And so many, you know, it's a crazy world. Things are complicated. So many things have become normalized. Things that, you know, parents say, things that back in my time, things that were considered wrong and immoral, perverted, things have become, so many, so many of those things have just become normalized now. How am I going to raise my child in a world like this? And Wallahi, as a parent, I think about this myself as well. And one of the pieces of advice that I give to parents is an advice that I want to share with all of you as well. And that is the, important, the importance of having a strong foundation. And I say that because when we build a strong foundation, when we have strong usul, strong principles, then we are better equipped to survive whatever the world throws at us. Whatever is happening in the world, we will be better equipped if we have a strong foundation. I think about that brother that I was once speaking to, who he told me, he said, I, I grew up with Ikna and YM and all that kind of stuff. And he goes, you know, I kind of lost my way. You know, when I was young, I, you know, I was in middle school and, and even high school, I was involved with YM. But I went to college, he said, but I lost my way because I felt this sense of freedom. I was finally away from my parents. They weren't watching over me. You know, and I saw things in college and they were very tempting and so on and so forth. And he goes, I went through a rough time. He goes, but through all of that, one of the things that I, that I always knew was the difference between right and wrong. He said, I did things, I did messed up stuff, right? But I knew what I was doing was wrong. And that may not seem like a big difference, but it is a very big difference. Because there's a difference between a person who does something thinking it is okay and normal and it's fine, it's just how it is, this is the world we're living in, versus a person who knows because of the foundation they were given as a young person that what I'm doing is wrong because that person has a path back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's something inside that is gnawing at them. And you know what that is? That is our fitrah. That is our natural state of being. And it is important to understand that fitrah. That fitrah is a part of our foundation. For it is important for us to understand that we are not created to give in to our base desires. We are not created to give in to every temptation. It can happen, and it's normal, it does happen. But that is not the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Allah created us to worship Him, to live our lives in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not always going to do that. We're, always, no, we're not always going to be the greatest at that. But the fact that it is part of us and we understand that is a very, very powerful tool. Because that means that we can weather the storm. 
when things become confusing, when things become difficult. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gives us an example of this in the Quran as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathalan kalimatan tayyiba ka shajaratin tayyiba. Allah says, do you not see how Allah compares or gives the example of the good word to a good tree? The good word being la ilaha illallah. The good word being tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the example of tawheed, the example of la ilaha illallah is like a good tree. Asluha thabit. The foundation of it is strong. It is deep-rooted. And its branches are high in the sky. Strong. We can withstand the winds. We can withstand the change of times and culture and normalization and trends and so on and so forth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us the example of an evil word. An evil word, in short, being that which takes us away from la ilaha illallah. وَمَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ خَبِيثَ كَشَجَرَةٍ خَبِيثَ The example of an evil word, a bad word, is like an evil tree or a bad tree. اجتثت من فوق الأرض It has been uprooted from the earth. ما لها من قرار It has no stability. So what does that mean? That means when we go away from our foundation, from Tawheed, from La ilaha illallah, that natural state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will never be able to be firm. One day, trends are going this way and we're going to be going that way. Another day, the trends are going this way and we're going to be going that way. And never are we going to find stability. It is only through our faith, it is only through Islam, it is only through La ilaha illallah do we remain firm regardless of what is happening in the world. As quote unquote crazy as the world gets, our foundation is strong. Our foundation is La ilaha illallah. You know, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimallahu ta'ala, I find it very interesting. I was reading um, a, a, you know, a, a passage where he was talking about politicians. And he was saying, you know, politicians, they are like a tree in the wind that is weak. Because they're blown left and right, like, and no, no pun intended, but the, 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 the culture and the norm is going one way, and they're going to that, go that way, because politicians, for the most part, they want to please people. And the idea is that the more people that like them, the better they're going to do, the better politician they're going to be. And so if all the people turn to something that's bad, well, it doesn't matter what is bad or good, it's, I'm going to go with the people. If society is going one way, well, I'm going to go that way because I've got to please the people. But our goal is not to please people. Our goal is la ilaha illallah. Our goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why, to me, conventions like this are so vital. Because it is at conventions like this that we revitalize our faith. And I know it's hard, subhanAllah, living as a minority in, in a culture, in a place, in a world where it seems like the majority is doing something else. The majority believes that something which is clearly our nafs understands that it's wrong and immoral, the majority tends to think it's okay. It's hard being in a world like that. But never forget the foundation that you have as a Muslim. Never forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the very fact that you understand that your fitrah, your nature is telling you to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means you have a strength that other people simply do not. That you will not be able to be knocked down regardless of the winds, regardless of what is happening in the world today. And this is why my brothers and sisters, it is important to be connected to our faith. And subhanAllah, in a, in a world, in the world that we're living in today, our faith even, subhanAllah, can get used for people's purposes. It can get used, it can become politicized. It can be used for people's agendas and so on and so forth. And this is why we need to be very, very careful about who we take our faith from. Where do we take our knowledge from? 
You know, subhanAllah, we live in a world today where, it's, where a lot of what we think of as good or bad is about image. How people are seen, how people are perceived. And I know we live in a culture of, of celebrity. Even in what I'm doing here right now, subhanAllah, we have celebrity du'at and celebrity shaykhs, and, and I'm not throwing shade, and I, you know, honestly, I, I get the irony of me being up here talking about this, but we got to be real. Our faith is not defined by individuals or how popular someone is. Our faith is defined by what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why our goal has to be that we want to follow the truth. We don't want to follow people. The only person that we can say we follow them blindly is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone else, they can be wrong. They can make mistakes. Their own desires can be involved in their message. They can have agendas and they can, whatever else can be part of their message except the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, there's a very scary hadith that I don't think has fully come true yet, but I think we're almost there. And that is a hadith regarding knowledge, authentic knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allah does not take away knowledge by snatching it away from you. Right? By just taking it away. Just taking it away from, from, from Allah's creation, from the servants. Walakin. يَقْبِضُ الْعِلْمِ بِقَبْضِ الْعُلَمَاء Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away the knowledge, authentic, good knowledge, that which is good and pure and correct by the scholars dying out. And I don't think we are there right now. Alhamdulillah. But as some of our scholars say, that it is possible to interpret this hadith, that it can partly be true. That without a doubt, ilm and scholars and ulama can lessen there can be less than there were before. And what is the outcome of that? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Hatta idha lam yabqi aliman, Until a time will come where no person of knowledge, no scholar, no alim is left. nas ru'usan juhala. They will take as their leaders the ignorant. The ignorant. Fasu'ilu. And people will ask them, who do we have left? We have only those who are ignorant. And so if there's no one else to ask, people will ask those who are ignorant. فَسُئِلُوا فَأَفْتَوْا And they won't remain silent. A person who is ignorant, but they're put in a position of leadership, they're put, on, they're put in front of a lot of people, they have a large following, and so on and so forth. Well, these people may begin to believe that because they're popular or known or because they're in a position of leadership, well, I know what I'm talking about. And so people will turn to them and ask them. And they will not hold back. They will give their fatwa. They will give their answer. They will respond. They will respond. They will give the answer without knowledge. They will go astray. And they will lead other people astray as well. And this hadith I know is scary. Especially in the times that we are living in today. But it is, this hadith should serve as a warning and as a reminder for us. To look at who we take our knowledge from. Because this knowledge as our scholars of the past they would say. That this knowledge is our deen. This knowledge is our faith. This is how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful who you take your faith from. Be careful, be careful who you take your deen from. Because this is our, once again, this is what keeps us firm. This is what keeps us grounded. And this is why we have evidence after evidence after evidence. We have ayat in the Quran. We have hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that reminds us of the merits of people of knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّ الْعُلَمَاءُ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءُ that the ulama, the scholars, they are the inheritors of the prophets. That the prophets don't leave behind any wealth, they don't leave behind money, they leave behind knowledge. And the scholars are those who inherit the knowledge from the prophets. 
العلماء. It is only the scholars who properly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are properly mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who have the khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this knowledge is our relationship with our Lord. And this is even more imperative in troubling times. When we feel like our faith can easily be shaken. When the norms are changing quickly. When things are becoming normalized. It becomes even more important that we recognize and we have the ability to recognize people of knowledge and understand that we take our knowledge from them. And so my brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with this. Learn your principles. Build a strong foundation. And no time, no age, it's never too late to say, you know what? I don't have time to learn my faith anymore. And it's very easy to get caught in the secondary issues. It's very easy to start arguing about certain fiqh issues and this and that, whatever. Every day, subhanAllah, online, there's a new controversy. There's a new hot take on Twitter, isn't there? Someone's like, my new hot take, check it out. Muslim Twitter, going crazy, because somebody said something controversial. And everybody's going at it back and forth or whatever. Or TikTok, some TikTok influencers like, you know what, here's my hot take of the day. Thousands of views, everybody sharing it, everybody talking about it. And I get it, it's a form of entertainment. And we find a certain level of comfort in that, and we enjoy that, and so on and so forth. But our deen has to be more than that. Because it is, as I said, the way we stay firm in these difficult times. And that is why I urge you, my brothers and sisters, turn to the people of knowledge and build a strong foundation for yourself. Hada wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tabu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.